it's no, it's a bravery be. problem, right? I, yeah. You know, there's there's vanishingly small technical reasons for not doing this, and vast amounts of human hand wringing and pants wetting problems. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is uh, TC Atomic Jedi. Today, I'm having a, a meeting with John Kutch. John Kutch is the man who started the Thorium Energy Alliance, and he has given a real podium to people who want to talk about thorium and about molten salt reactors and all that kind of stuff. So say hello, John. <laughs> hello. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. I'm very grateful for any chance I get to talk about this subject. Right. So, so, so the Thorium Energy Alliance, the, 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 I mean, the first speaking gig that I ever got, I got at your uh, venue mm -hmm. in uh, St. Louis. That was the first time ever uh, speaking really? public, publicly about, about nuclear energy. I was already writing books about nuclear energy years before that, but I never actually got to speak to an audience. Uh, so that was the first time. And I've done it many times ever since, but that was a really, a really cool place to start. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm glad that we had that chance to do that for you. That was, uh, we were grateful that you were able to make it. We, you know, we've always wanted it to be an international organization. So that was right, great. Right. And, and, and the point is because thorium, I mean, it's still not mainstream, right. To talk about, about thorium and people, people basically they raise their nose when somebody, you know, starts talking about thorium and, and I, I always wondered why the hell is that, you know, because yeah. it, it's there. Why not use it? Right. That, <laughs> that, yeah. that that has always been my rationale. So can you tell me something, you know, why would, why, why you are so passionate about Thorium? Why, why should we use it? Uh, so the basic thing that caught my eye when I was uh, assigned by one of my clients to look at Thorium, uh, he wanted to use it as a metal and, uh, it didn't work out for what he wanted to use it for, but looking into it, I was very intrigued by like all the possibilities that of what we missed. You know, it didn't take much. Even back then in 2005, 2007, there was some okay information about it and also some uh, related information about how like there was this thing called a molten salt reactor that was originally intended to be the civilian reactor for the United States and thorium had been intended to be the civilian nuclear fuel for the United States. And, and, you know, I was just like anybody else who gets into it today. I'm like, why didn't this happen? How did we miss this opportunity? And, and then I very quickly learned even more compelling things that we, you know, there's no such thing as highly enriched thorium. So we don't have that very, uh, you know, problematic, fraught, and energy-intensive process. Thorium is fertile and not fissile, so it's much easier to handle. And, you know, very quickly, most intriguing to me was that it was uh, it was a mining byproduct from uh, mining primary ores like titanium and iron <clears throat> and phosphate minerals. And you always found rare earths with thorium and some uranium sometimes i'm like you know essentially and effectively arguably you get thorium for free because no you know somebody's mining something else they sometimes if they're smart will try and do something with the rare earths and what do they do with the thorium well they throw it in a tailings pond or pretend it doesn't exist same thing with the the uranium and i'm just like you know there's all these uses for thorium and we're just throwing it away it's a you know to me that was a catastrophe that we could have uh avoided and so that's why we started me and a couple dudes started the thorium energy alliance back in 2007 jesus 2007 so three years from now that will be 20 years ago <laughs> yeah thanks thanks that makes me feel great like, am, I, am i dating you right now <laughs> yeah, yeah also it, i could write the i could write a follow-up book like the seven habits of highly ineffectual, uh, you know, <laughs> although actually we have to, we've, we've made a lot of progress. You know, you, you, you brought it up that, you know, people, especially in the industry don't readily, you know, leap towards using thorium, mm. but a lot of that had to do with the, uh, actual NRC and, uh, department of energy policy 
and they've changed it recently. So now where you literally were specifically not to fund anything with thorium uh, related, they've withdrawn that. As a matter of fact, we, the Thorium Energy Alliance, actually submitted some proposals and we got uh, a couple encouraged letters, which is uh, a big step. It doesn't sound like much, sounds pretty innocuous, but an encouraged letter basically says, hey, you know, we're very interested and very serious about you know, trying to get this done, you know, so it's, uh, you know, we've gotten past several gatekeepers with uh, these proposals we have, and it all has to do with using thorium as a material, not a fuel. There's oh, right. There's companies like Copenhagen Atomics that are very actively trying to use thorium as a fuel, clean core thorium energy, very actively trying to use thorium as a fuel. So we figure there's people that are trying to use thorium as a fuel, we need to be the ones that try and get thorium uh, recognized as a critical material. And so, so yeah, it seems like we've been at it for a long time, 15, 16, 17 years, but uh, it's not for nothing. There's companies that have come out of Thorium Energy Alliance, you know, uh, and uh, technologies have been revived and uh, the policies at Department of Energy, NRC, Department of Defense, you know, they've all, been you know it's like trying to turn a very big ship but you know we can we can see the ship is starting to you know pretty actively be turned now so so what kind of machine would use thorium i mean you and i both know this but i don't i i don't guess that the audience does so so let's 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 get some some insight in that i think if you're referring to using thorium as a fuel mm -hmm. you know it's just like uh you know there's gasoline and diesel you know, maybe bunker oil. So they're, you know, they each, you know, you can have a diesel car, you can have a gasoline car, you know, you could have the same car could be made to use diesel you know, you could swap out the engine and, you know, get a gas version of it, you know, like a Mercedes, you know, or a truck, you know, you could get a diesel pickup truck or a gasoline. So it's, but there's no like specific machine that, you know, for using it, we have light bridge, which is made, solid fuel rods uh for light water reactors and their original name of light bridge was thorium power <laughs> so they have clearly you know done some work on trying to make solid thorium fuels uh china and canada developed a can do reactor that used uh thorium mixed oxide in their can do reactor in china uh clean core thorium energy has another can do fuel that's made a lot of waves lately. It's uh, gotten through testing and exposure testing at Idaho National Lab, and now they're on their way to Canada to do some further fuel qualifications. And of course, famously, uh, another great missed opportunity was back in the 60s, the molten salt research reactor, MSRE, uh, was started on plain old uranium 235. Then they tried uranium-233, and right then, uh, Richard Nixon's uh, nuclear advisor is a, is a man in, in charge of everything, said, no, we're putting all our, all our uh, beans in the uh, breeder reactor, which actually is funny because thor you know, thorium reactor, uh, thorium-based molten salt reactor could be a breeder reactor, you know? So <laughs> they tried to call it an MSBR, molten salt <laughs> breeder reactor. After that, didn't work, you know? But uh, so the Chinese right now are the only ones in the world that we know of running an actual molten salt reactor running with thorium as it's as uh, a major component of its fuel the whole deal with this enriched uranium problem which we have at this moment many many people probably don't know but uh, roughly 50 percent of all the enriched uranium in in the world is is being produced by russia today and since the war in ukraine everybody is you know everybody is is reevaluating that position should we buy as much uranium from russia or not and, yeah. and, and you see by, you know, all the plants, everybody is trying to increase their enrichment capabilities. So I was hoping that this would become, you know, the, the light bulb moment for some people to say, well, you know what, <laughs> we, can't, we can't rely on Russian enriched uranium. So maybe 
we should diversify our fuel a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> especially when we've got billions of kilograms of uh, perfectly usable, arguably safer to use fuel sitting around in tailings ponds. Uh, here in the United States, uh, there's phosphate mines for fertilizer that throw away arguably billions and billions of dollars worth of rare earths and thorium and uranium each year because they just don't want to deal with you know they're like well we're fertilizer companies you know we don't want to deal with uh, this activated stuff this source material we'll you know we can pretend it's undisturbed which is a sort of a you know technical term uh you know and they if they don't try and separate it or do anything with it and throw it right back in the hole they got it out of more or less, they can say, well, we didn't do nothing to it, it even though they did remains, a lot. <laughs> it remains norm, natural yeah, it, radioactive material. <laughs> yeah, it's norm. It's naturally occurring. So it's a uh, right. But, it, you know, it's and companies over the years have tried to get at it. Uh, and it's it's only been recently that uranium prices have gone up from, you know, seven dollars a kilogram to like 170 a kilogram, I believe something, you know, that's a lot, whatever. Don't, don't quote me on the exact number, but it's a, it's a heck of a lot more than it used to be. So now all these people are at least in the United States. And like you said, with the war, they're trying to reopen up, you know, five or six uh, uranium extraction facilities here in the United States and all uranium mines are in situ these days, you know, no one's, no one's going below ground to the, helmet and a light and a pickaxe you know there's these are just they inject a fluid in the water uh, in the ground and suck the fluid back out and extract a aqueous solution what it basically does is this it, it's a solvent that's being yeah. pushed underground and it's so it basically dissolves the uranium and, and that gets pumped back up then yeah and unfortunately uh a little weird you know historical oddity that that is very safe you barely even know that mining is taking place but it's in a way it's a distraction or it takes them their attention off the ball in terms of like utilizing uh like thorium thorium from iron mines thorium from rutil titanium mines thorium from phosphate mines because that is a more traditional ore body right so there they would be pulling monazite or some other mineral out, grinding it up into baby powder, digest, you know, doing acid extraction. And because they're already doing the extraction, the first step below ground with the aqueous uh, extraction, you know, they're, they're able to basically ignore the thorium issue. And so, you know, we, we take our wins where we can get them. Uh, we have the lucky problem these days, uh, Thorium Energy Alliance is actively trying to source many, many hundreds of tons of thorium for people who want to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's companies that are trying to get back into using thorium as a critical material, as a catalyst, as an additive to alloys, ceramics, optics, you know, even a little bit for medicines, uh, uh, um, you know, and obviously fuel, there's some, there's a great need. Uh, so the irony is while there's, billions of kilograms of it laying around on the ground <laughs> it's very hard to get our hands on it you know and especially in those quantities you know we're we're, we're obviously greatly exceeding the the quantities that any uh, american is allowed to hold on to at any one time it, it's bizarre isn't it that it's such a such a such a hot potato nobody Nobody really wants to burn its, you know, burn himself handling, handling <laughs> a hot potato. But the point is, I I just took a took a I just take took a look at the at the at a resource map of Europe, and just the, the the sheer volume of phosphates and monazite and all that stuff. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 it, it's not going to be a resource problem. It's not like we can't we can't find this stuff. It's no, it's a bravery that. problem, right? I, yeah. You know, there's there's vanishingly small technical reasons for not doing this and vast amounts of human hand-wringing and pants-wetting problems. <laughs> and, and that's you know, the whole thing. That's the whole thing. But but is it, isn't that the whole problem with, with the entire nuclear industry at this moment? I mean... 
You know, I think that finally, at least in the United States and, and you know, France, I have a great deal of admiration for France and South Korea is mm -hmm. arguably the world's best nuclear builders right now. You, They could very well demonstrate that like Baraka one through four were effectively built on time and on budget. You know, some people will equivocate on that. I'm like, you know. They're they are the best in the world. They they did it know, in they, eight or nine years. I mean, it's it's yeah. They 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 got it done. And some people are like, well, they went over budget. It's like they started from nothing. They started from uh, some waterfront property, and they had to build roads and substations, exactly. a university, you know, an actual regulator. They had to train all the operators. They did pretty good. They had you know? zero experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they they did great for what they had to do. And uh, France, you know. Uh, Hopefully they correct course a little bit and, you know, 80%, you know, nuclear, what a, what an incredibly, you know, forward thinking, brave thing to do and how unbelievably well served they've been by that sort of energy security for their, for their country, you know, how their next door neighbor, Germany has shot themselves in the foot so incredibly badly, but you know, the Nordic countries, you got mm. Sweden is a great example Canada is a is a wonderful example of uh, you know pretty much getting completely off of coal and relying mostly on nuclear and hydro, some natural gas, you know, a vanishingly small amount of renewable, you know, and uh, but uh, so the United States uh, finally has Constellation is a pure nuclear play, right? That all they do is manage a, a fleet of nuclear reactors. And so they're able to talk very proudly and loudly about how nuclear is a, a hugely important answer, whereas all the other energy companies in the United States have wind and coal and solar and hydro and nuclear and co you know natural <laughs> gas. And so they're like, oh, my babies are beautiful children. You know, they all have a place and, uh, you know, they don't. Some of those babies are ugly and uh misshapen and horrible and uh <laughs> you know causing lots of problems in the world and uh and really i mean i see the world through nuclear colored glasses but oh, you know same. every country should be france every country should be 85 90 percent i'd say 100 percent nuclear i i don't i don't understand these people who are like well Nuclear can do baseload while we rely on solar and wind. Why would we do that? What is the, you know, it's like, well, yeah. we can have this super reliable energy source, uh, but we will, uh, we will inject chaos and intermittency on purpose at huge cost into the system. For what reason? To feel good? Yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> nobody it's, in their right mind would do that. It's amazing, know? isn't it? Because whenever you, 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 you envision your your country to run on renewables. All you're saying is we are ready to build at least two systems. You know, we have the we have the renewable system and we have the system that will take over once renewable fails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it happens. It happens each year in Germany. They just had two weeks of renewable failure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had a dead no wind, right? Yeah, for like eighteen days, and they had. Uh... And they're Germany, so they're practically at the Arctic Circle. <laughs> <laughs> so what sun are they getting in the middle of winter? Nothing, you know? No, it's 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 fairly little. I mean, I live in the Netherlands. We are right next to Germany, you know, halfway. And um, our, our our capacity factor for solar is 10% over the year. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's ridiculous. It's nothing. And and, and just the, 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 the amount of solar that has been installed in the netherlands alone it's 20 gigawatts uh, and it's it's more than our grid can handle <laughs> and it does and it doesn't work 90 percent of the time yeah oh at least and uh you know when it does come on we have a i don't mean to get off uh, the topic of thorium but you know we could someday talk about the grid instability caused by inrush energy, wind suddenly picking up, sun coming mm. out from behind the clouds. And, you know, down in Texas and, you know, my USA centric view of the world, you know, Texas is paying a terrible price for having <clears throat> so much renewable. They they're blowing out transformers. They're overloading uh, electric lines. You know, the you know, switches and substations are being taken offline constantly. 
And, uh, you know, when it's, when it's, you know, 35 degrees Celsius out or, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, 20 below Celsius out, you know, none of that stuff works. Batteries don't work when they're really hot and batteries don't work when they're really cold. It's just, it's elect, they call it electronic generation, right? So it's like when you're relying on electronic generation, it's just like your cell phone. When you open it up, it says, don't use this cell phone when it's really cold or right. really hot. You know, so it's it's just like your toaster, your cell phone, you know, the radio. It's like, you know, we're just talking about another piece of electronics and, you know, big sheets of uh, integrated circuits called solar cells, you know, can't be relied on when it's too hot, too sunny, uh, too cold. You know, they just, <laughs> it's the most miserable form. It's like self-flagellation. It's like, we've had things too good. We need to just suffer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, what I what I, I just used the, the metaphor that, you know, everybody who, who, who likes renewables very much, they usually talk about this, this, this beautiful, uh, this, this beautiful vision, you know. And I'm, then I come along and I say, Listen, it's just a mirage. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be gone. That's an excellent way to put it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's just a mirage. It's a hallucinatory state that you're in. You're 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 in a you're in a religious miasma. It's you know, mass you're, psychosis. Yeah, that's so what it you, is. And then there's yeah. there, there's loads of people, loads of people who work at universities like Mark C. Jacobson, and 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 over here in Europe we have we have the same figures who just keep putting out this 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 stuff with which they try to sell everybody on this on this idea that you can do it you know if you if you want it hard enough then it will happen that's that's that that's yeah. what it seems like to me and then i come then i come and, and introduce my arguments and then those people get mad at me because they say oh how dare you how dare you suggest that there will be problems with this system you yeah know? i'm like well oh, it's it's a it's a form of uh, green religious fundamentalism, right? You know they've they've they they all belong to a church, and uh, you know you're an apostate if you don't follow the the prerequisites of the of the you know the belief system. So and it, and it's very hard, and I feel bad because you know the mirage exists because they can put a piece of glass out there, and the glass generates electrons, and they say, see. You know, they put a windmill out in a field and it spins and they say, so it's like they're, they're bamboozled by the fact that something is happening, but it's not happening reliably or to the degree, degree that it could ever, ever, ever help, you know, especially not an industrial society. You know, the, the old saying, I, I speak quite often at steel conferences because uh, I, I work very vigorously to say when I'm talking about nuclear energy, and not materials per se, I'm like, look, I'm agnostic in a lot of sense. You must start putting nuclear behind the meter. You know, steel mills, big steel mills should have their own nuclear power plants for heat and electricity. Mm -hmm. You know, you could make hydrogen. You know, the everybody's like, we just don't know how to make carbon-free uh, ammonia. We don't know how to make synthetic fuels. We don't know how to make direct reduced iron because hydrogen is $20 a kilogram. It's like, no, it's not. It's under a dollar if you make it with nuclear. So put on your big boy pants and start making nuclear reactors on your factory sites. And you can have hydrogen that is cheaper than fossil hydrogen and cheaper because you don't have beta. Beta is risk. Beta is variability. You know, natural gas could be two dollars a million BTU one day and eighteen the next. Oh, yeah. And Europe, you know, Europe is you know that in spades. Put another zero on there. You know, you don't. You guys don't know what's happening anymore, and you got a little war in your backyard that's causing even more chaos. That, you know, and so the the, uh, the the doldrums that we were talking about just now. You know, in Germany, the two week doldrum. Uh, yeah. The first day, gas the electricity price went up to 800 euros per megawatt hour. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, no wonder you're having gas. to do this. You're yeah. doing the show from outside, right? I'm looking at your background. You're just sitting on your back porch because yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. afford to heat your house anymore. <laughs> well, that's that's the Christmas spirit. No, but, but the point is, the point is everybody in Europe uses, well, most people use gas to heat their homes. Most people use gas sure. to cook. 
So, I mean, the, the, the demand for gas is huge. It's huge. Yeah. You also tried to make electricity with it. So, I mean, well, and, and if they're fooling themselves and thinking, oh, I got a heat pump, I'm using electricity. It's like, where do you think that electricity came from? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you need it most at 3 a.m., when you don't want to freeze to death and you don't want your baby to die, are you going to rely on solar? No, mm-hmm. of course not. Are you going to rely on batteries? You'd be a fool. You know, are you relying on wind? Absolutely not. You're relying on natural gas. Exactly, and the French are relying on nuclear. the the other The other day, it's funny that you that you bring up France. Today, it was today, in fact. Uh, Chris, Christy Gogan, she she shared a, a a picture of her visiting a, a an aluminium plant in France, and and it's really it's situated in in line of sight with six nuclear reactors. Hmm. And, and my rea- my response to that picture was: Listen, any any serious country wants to foster a healthy, heavy industry has to co-locate with nuclear. That's that's the only reason, or that's the only way to do it. Germany today, ThyssenKrupp, which is a, a massive steel producer, right? Sure. They, they just announced, that it, it was uh, earlier this week, they announced that they are going to lay off 11,000 people. Oh, my God. Well, that's like we were working very closely with Yara mm. when... Yeah, we had a more, much more active role with the Ammonia Energy Association mm-hmm. and Yara. You know, when the war started, Yara was like, that's it. It's like, now imagine if 30 years ago they would built a nuclear reactor, they wouldn't even bat an eye. No. But now Europe's paying 5x if they can get it for fertilizer. So now you guys are essentially exhausting your land to grow food. Yep. Because you're not putting enough fertilizer on. And, you know, where do you get fertilizer today? Obviously, most people know that you extract hydrogen from, from natural gas, steam, methane, yep. reformation. Well, you know, even if you, uh, you know, I, I don't want to bore your viewership there, but like, <laughs> you know, there's so many ways to implement even low quality nuclear heat, like from a lo- light water reactor. You know, the heat from a light water reactor actually isn't that great. But even with that, if you, you know, you can make up not great with volume, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, and, and so you, you know, if you've got bad heat, but a lot of it, you can make good heat. Yeah, you can work it up. Right. So, I mean, the, the lost opportunity here in the United States, uh, I uh, am Chicago based fella. You know, we have Whiting, Indiana, one of the biggest refineries around. And, you know, they talked back in the 50s about putting a nuclear power plant there. And if you do that, people don't realize you burn about a quarter to a third of the oil to make the rest of the oil. Yeah. Imagine if we suddenly overnight had a quarter more oil to burn, you know, instead of making it, we could use it for stuff. And that's they've known about that for 60, 70 years as an option so that instead of burning, you know, the bunker oil and the refinery gases, they could have operated those hydrogenate them, do things, make interesting stuff, lubricants, whatever asphalt, even, you know, that doesn't have to all be gasoline and diesel. And it, it's been a 50 year lost opportunity. Uh, Dow recently, as I'm sure, you know, is, has a relationship looking at X energy to yep. possibly put a couple X energy units behind the, behind the uh, meter, which is great. Good for them. I hope they look at multiple different other technology vendors besides just high temperature gas. Uh, Kairos has deals. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence boom is, you know, creating a lot of interesting partnerships out there. So, you know, even you may know or recall that Thorium Energy Alliance has had a small uh, role that we're very proud of in helping El Salvador, a relatively small country, try and introduce a civilian nuclear. So I'm always using them as an example. I'm like, El Salvador has enough sense to realize they're 85 percent hydro and geothermal and and they're but they're that's it. That's as much as anybody could ever hope for. They're they're a green person's wet dream, maxed and they're they, they're maxed out. And they aren't in energy poverty, but their people deserve more energy, you know. And they're having to spend precious dollars and resources buying diesel fuel from others by buying natural gas from others for their peaker plant. Uh, for their thermal rotational generation to make up shortfalls when the water 
is not as available as it is when the thermal uh, geothermal is not running as great as they they want, or when the sun and the wind, you know, they don't really have wind there. Weirdly enough, even though they're right on the ocean, it's just yeah. a oddity. So, uh, Naib Bukele and uh, the the other leadership there have understood the only way we're going to triple our amount of energy is if we go with nuclear. You know, because they have some petroleum resources there but if they if they ever were able to tap into them they'd be stupid to burn them to make electrons you know there's so many other valuable things you can do with it besides that especially when there's available technologies and soon to be available technologies and that they're also a very good example kind of circles back in that they specifically said they wanted to use thorium uh, and it, the because of all the reasons that we stated earlier, but one that people, it's non-proliferating, right? So they, they're they a small country. They want to make it absolutely clear to all their neighbors, especially the big nine billion pound gorilla of the United States. Mm. This is not weapons. This is civilian nuclear. This is what John F. Kennedy and Glenn Seaborg said should be civilian nuclear. Advanced reactors using thorium should be the civilian nuclear system. And we missed that opportunity in the United States. But, you know, uh, El Salvador could be hugely well served by by that. Uh, you know, and, and I'm very proud of them. I, I do, you know, I don't know how much time you have or, you we know, how much, uh, how many world. megabytes of memory we're about to run out of, you know, you're gonna have to <laughs> plug in another hard drive. But, uh, uh, you know, I always, I've been lately ranting about these smarty, smarty pants professors and you come across them every once in a while and they're like, no, thorium could be made into a bomb. I'm like, oh, explain to me how that works. And ex then explain to me how nobody on planet earth does that. You know, all these rogue nations, Iran, you know, why, you know, it, it, India it, supposedly it, doesn't have any weapons material. They've got beaches full of thorium. It, so it's theory, like it should be very easy because what everybody says is you breed the, you basically turn thorium 232 into protactinium and, and that then decays into uranium eventually. And, <laughs> and all you need to do is siphon that off and you have pure uranium 232. Oh. If it were that easy, there were there would have been at least ten countries who would who were absolutely. I mean, that's the proof is in the pudding, right? Yeah. It's like I call them chalkboard smarty pants. They like to sit there on their chalkboard and see this and then this and then this. And I'm like, I'm like, then nobody does it. And they're like, well, you just need an accelerator. I'm like, oh, so you just need a gigantic glowing billion dollar piece of kit. You know, you could use that same money and go on the dark web and just find a a retired. Uh, radio chemist from russia who who made off with 50 pounds of plutonium right. and you know buy it for a lot less than that then you know if you, if you need to make yourself a bomb i mean it's lunacy that these people think that that 75 80 years of knowledge about thorium as a nuclear fuel and its nuclear properties you know it's like well they they just haven't realized it yet it's like we made two u-233 bombs back in the 60s we blew one off. It was such a fiasco. We destroyed the other one and we said never again. And that's a lesson to any would be bomb maker making anything out of thorium uh, bomb wise or weapons wise is banana cream sauce. And don't try it. You know, it's cuckoo bananas. And uh, and so I believe that to the you know, those are fighting words for me. I'll defend thorium's nonproliferation. uh profile to the uh, end of the the time there because you know we've we just never see anything that comes from it uh, we see a lot of blather and a lot of talk and no reality yeah, and, the and the point is i mean enrichment enrichment technology has big is so i mean so well understood by this time i mean the big the big boys who want to who want to enrich uranium up to to bomb grade material they can do it if they want to yeah. So, so I mean, there's there's no point. The genie is already out of the bottle. Uh, yeah. And and and, and, and sure, uh, some 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 rogue state might try to uh, turn thorium into bomb grade fissile material uh, by breeding Pluto by breeding uranium two thirty three. But I mean, everybody will know what they're doing, uh, and they will yeah. be sanctioned into oblivion if they if they if they try to. So. Yeah, it's it's so right. I appreciate that. Uh, 
that backup there. It's it's very you know, it actually it's it's one of the you know the the enemies of this stuff. The people who want us to do the bad, sucky, intermittent, you know, unreliable energy, they grasp at straws. They they they'll they pick you know any weak point they can find. Obviously, as an as a related topic, you know the they will never let storage. They'll work to the ends of the earth to keep storage and safe storage from happening because they know that's the last, you know, the last argument anyone can make against nuclear is like, what do we do with the waste? It's like, well, we know exactly what to do with the waste. Yeah. And we've known for decades what to do with the waste. And it's been incredibly safe, successful, long history. Uh, you know, nobody's ever stolen waste. Waste has never gone unaccounted for. You can't no one's run away died with from it. You know, <laughs> try, um, try, try to steal a cubic meter of uranium. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's like, uh, so, but they know they want to, that's their last boogeyman. You know, that's their last boogeyman. And so we need to, as a group, whether you support thorium or nuclear or thorium nuclear or whatever, but, you know, the one thing we can all agree on by far, by a lot, is that we need to resolve this waste boogeyman false issue and you know if you can talk to your neighbors or go online or post all to my, your favorite all my neighbors are already have already been converted <laughs> yeah 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 they they have to be otherwise they're gonna be like oh god there, here he there, comes there, again yeah 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 <laughs> well, well the, the point is and and it's nice that we we are we are broaching this subject i mean I understand that when I start talking about thorium, some of my some of some of the people who follow me, they they basically think, oh no, here he goes again. Listen, I I rolled into becoming pro nuclear thanks to Gordon's videos, right? Gordon McDowell, for those sure. who don't know, uh, he basically I I already was pro nuclear, but I never never thought about you know how how can we build these and and, and what is available. And then you start searching stuff on Google. And I mean, this is like 2011 or something. And and I, I rolled into becoming really rapidly pro-nuclear through the thorium movement. Mm -hmm. So 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 this is something that I will always, always, um, always cherish. Because even though I have become a uranium guy, I love, uh, I don't care whether it is powered by uranium, thorium, plutonium, <laughs> yeah. as long as it is a, a, a nuclear machine that lets neutrons do their work, uh, I'm done with it. Uh, but it, it really doesn't make any sense to me just, just to keep thorium off the playing field, uh, whether, whether yeah. you are pro-nuclear or whether you are a renewables person or whatever it's it, it's it just doesn't make any sense to me that we 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 simply forego all the benefits of this of this great potential energy source that's that's just being thrown away as if it is waste yeah and um you know to that agnostic level what you're talking about uh you know i think one of the most exciting things developments relatively recently is that Companies are seriously talking about using spent nuclear fuel again. Mm -hmm. You know, you haven't heard somebody talk about that in 45 years, you know, not since Jimmy Carter, you know, killed the uh, ability to reprocess. I mean, France obviously is famously reprocesses uh, their fuel. No, oh, yeah. Our, our little pressurized water reactor runs on Mox from France. You know, there you go. And so, uh, you know, so you have Copenhagen Atomics. Curio legacy here in the United States, uh, you know, a couple other companies that want to use, you know, spent nuclear fuel, at least part of their fuel budget. So that's, that's an example. Like I want that. I want people to do that. That's a one way we can close the loop, shut up some of these people about nuclear waste, all that good stuff in terms of a lost opportunity with thorium you know i i might sound like a broken record but one of the biggest loss opportunities is the material properties you know it's been 20 years that the department of energy and the national institutes of health in the united states begged the only time they ever put out a joint report begging somebody to start making actinium 225 uh, and bismuth cancer drugs and those are both derived from milking thorium and they are the most successful metastatic cancer treatments. If you got cancer, oh, drug alpha, alpha, meters, alpha meters, 
Yes, they're, you know, when you make those, they're intense alpha emitters. So what makes them so potent is that when you use something like a PSA antigen to attach the radionucleotide on there and, the, and it attacks the tumor, it decimates the tumor at a very close range, but it leaves the healthy healthy cells undamaged. So it's, it's, a, it's a miracle. They had near 100% cure rates and uh, super extended survival rates and almost no remission. But even then, it took, you know, nearly two decades for people to pick that ball back up. So Oak Ridge National Lab revived their milking operation. TerraPower, Bill Gates' company, is doing some work with it. Shine Medical, as Shine, far as yeah. I know, is doing some some work with it. Uh, they, they are they're accelerator driven. Yeah, and they're right up here, the, just north of me in Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, DJ LeClaire, I think, works for them now, to be honest. Oh, really? I, I, yeah, I think so. I'd have to, uh, you know, I'm going to hear from him now if, if he doesn't. But uh, anywho, so the the other things we've lost, alloys, you know, all the original Gemini what, what does, spacecraft. What does thorium do as an alloy material? What does it do? Does it make it stronger or? Yep. So it. It's it makes thorium is an incredible material in that it's it needs to be in its own classification. I'm glad you brought that up. Right now, thorium is classed only by one metric, whether it can be used as a nuclear fuel. Mm. So thorium is controlled by the NRC as a nuclear fuel along with uranium and plutonium. Right. And it needs to be broken away from there because uranium and plutonium almost only can be used as a nuclear fuel. There really aren't industrial applications for them hardly. And whereas uh, thorium, you know, uh, acts crazy like a platinum group metal, like a refractory group metal, like a, a, like a lanthanum group metal, you know, rare earth metal, it, it has properties of all three. So it's Ultra high temperature. It's got super strength, uh, and uh, you know it adds a, it adds a, a tremendous strength component to to metals. It it increases conductivity in metals, so that's why uh, your microwave in your house almost for sure has a thoriated magnetron. The radar system at your airport uses a thoriated magnetron. If you go to a weld shop near you and they weld anything like a high nickel alloys, almost for sure they have thoriated welding wire and thoriated tungsten welding rods because the thorium atom is a big fat atom with bunches of electrons to give up. So it helps sustain a spark even in some of the worst metals for trying to sustain a spark in. You know, that's just one example. You know, we we have uh, um, encouraged and supported research. In is, it, is it hexavalent, by the way? Is it hexavalent or? Oh, you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> You know, I'm, like, I'm not a I'm not a radio chemist. It, it or, has I'm, electrons to share. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a the way it's been explained to my dumb ass is that it's big fat atom with lots of electrons to share and, and other stuff. <laughs> it's but, good enough. <laughs> but uh, you know, um, in the world of alloys, it you know there's mag thor, thor chrome, alumithor. There's thoriated. Uh, uh, all, there, there, there's a whole panoply of stuff we looked at 50, 60 years ago, and the properties were tremendous. The thorium, ceramic, thoria, you know, there's alumina. Like you, when you're in your lab class, you have alumina crucibles because mm-hmm. they're so, well, alumina is nothing compared to thoria. Thoria crucibles haven't been made for a while. So when you go on eBay and you look for them, people are selling them for like little tiny thimble-sized crucibles for thousands of dollars because – they're the only yeah. way you can do some of these small metallurgical experiments, right? Right. Yeah, and and because I if mean, you want all this, melt- so all this stuff that exists that uses thorium as an alloy material or something like that, yeah. all of that is old, right? It's oh, it's no, it's no longer made right now. Well, you can still buy. I mean, there's still even after all the pressure and policy and regulatory headaches of dealing with it, it's still so valuable that. Companies like Materion will still sell thorium. Thorium is still used as a standard, uh, you know, when you're doing a material analysis. And there's still like thoriated tungsten. You could go buy it at any welding supply store. And, you know, because it, 
its properties can't be duplicated, right? There's no substitute. It's an elemental element on the table. It, uh, you know, and like I said, it's one of the most, like they try and make cerium uh, doped welding rods and they work. And some say they work nearly as well as, you know, thorated tungsten, but you know, why take second best? Mm. You know, they, and so it's like, all your substitutes are never going to be as good as the real thing. So, uh, you know, that is where we spend a lot of our time. Like thoriated optics, uh, you know, one or two percent thorium in the glass making process makes for the clearest glass in the world. And they used yeah, to make thorium. Exactly. That's they, they also used uranium and they used neodymium for that, I believe. Right. Sure. Uranium glass is a little weird because it gets. You know, it gets that cool green color, mm -hmm. whereas thorium, uh, in terms of like the lowest ref refractivity glass ever, right? It does have a little bit of a yellow cast to it, so you have to like color correct a little bit. But if you want totally un uh, uh, unwarped pictures or undistorted pictures, you know, people still go and try and buy thoriated lenses from the 60s you know and of course all the like the they're like oh you gotta worry about putting this radioactive glass up to your eye when you're taking a picture it's like <laughs> you shut up you know will you please stop being fear mongers everybody knows that fears gets clicks right you know and so they just love to you know do bullshit like if you've got this lens in your drawer make sure you throw it away now it's like throw it away into my mailbox because i will take all the thoriated lenses and thoriated everything you can you know we we like we have a museum of old products that used to be available and they used to be toothpaste and uh, the, 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 the well, I wouldn't recommend the toothpaste so much. You're like, you know, I don't want you eating it. No, 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 no. But and, and, and there used to be these these things that you can put on lanterns that would burn. Oh yeah, thoriated gas lantern mantles. I mean, though, yeah. those are, uh, you know, those are the brightest. You know, those actually created a revel. One of the weirdest things is thorium was something like the eighth element identified in the periodic table. I'm like, how is that possible that that was the eighth, you know, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it was like 1846 by Bezerbelius, you know, uh, <laughs> all these people online are going to be like, this guy's a thorium dude and he can't say the, <laughs> but, but uh, uh, anywho, you know, the, the point is we, we had a 150 year history of working with this material and thorium gas lantern mantles revolutionized lighting, street lights, Theater lighting, it was super safe, ultra bright. You know, it, it, like it brought public safety. It was inexpensive. They lasted a ton of time, you know, and people like, well, you know, they made a mess with the monazite. It's like, well, they made a mess with everything back then. You know, they killed mm -hmm. they killed so many cows in Chicago. They clogged the river with their guts. You know, it's like it's, it's like back in the 1800s, you know, they did, you know, they did everything badly. But, uh, you know, one of the things that that. Uh, I I like to bring back is is uh, like the thoriated the mag thor, you know all the fighter jets and spacecraft in the sixties and seventies hmm. were made with this material because it was super strong, super heat resistant, and one of the you know one of the crazy reasons they stopped using it is like well uh, it exposed our pilots to some some radiation. It's like hey you know how you do that. You paint it, and then it won't expose. And by the way, you're at thirty thousand feet. I think you got a little more cosmic radiation to worry about than, you know, a gusset on your I mean, wing. What does what does thorium? What, what is its decay? Uh, does it does it fourteen and a half billion year half life? And it, and it's an alpha decay, right? Or or what is it? You know, it's got a little bit of. It's vastly mostly an alpha emitter, and uh, yeah, paint it's got a. It, <laughs> Like you can type in gamma profile of thorium. So there is there is a gamma comes out, a beta will come out, but you know, it's it's mostly an alpha emitter. And uh uh you know it's it's that's what makes it easy to handle. You know, you can have a million pounds of thorium metal sitting in a pile and it's not gonna get weird. You have, you know, a couple hundred pounds of uranium, even natural uranium sitting in a pile and it's going to start getting funky. You know, <laughs> Th things are going to start to happen. So it's like uh, it's it it just goes back to what I was saying about that is why they wanted thorium to be the civilian nuclear fuel.
Now, obviously, for those a little, a little bit more in the know, know. You, you do need a neutron source, right? So it's fertile, it's not fizzle. You need to start a thorium-based fuel with a little bit, so spent nuclear fuel, plutonium, uranium. You do need a, a, a neutron seed. source. Yeah, you need a seed. Yeah, so it's like, start, I tell people it's like starting a bonfire, you know. You need to light some twigs on fire to get the logs going, you know. Yeah, but once, once it's going, you... I mean, you probably, I, I don't know enough about it, but you probably need to add a little bit of enriched uranium every now and then, or does it just breed enough well, uranium 233 that it can keep itself running? You know, there's so many fuel cycles. I mean, there's, there's obviously a famous one called Pure, where it's just, you know, it goes from thorium to thorium 232 to th- uranium 233. Uranium 233 gives up a, neutron and it be, you know goes back to being thorium so it's pure you know it's called the pure cycle because there's you know almost no de minimis amount of any sort of waste uh you know at all and uh uh it's, that's kind of the holy grail there but uh you know it's it although the pure cycle seems very simple keeping it sustained and running that way requires like a two region reactor where you're feeding stuff from a blanket reactor into a core and it's you know it gets a little you know a little spicy technically to to do that but you know who knows maybe maybe some of the companies pursuing that idea of a blanket region and a core region or a central region can work out some of the uh is, is some of the what issues Copenhagen there. Atomics is doing at this moment with their onion core Copenhagen Atomics has a there's a very similar situation like that where they've got a outer blanket and then they use heavy water as a moderator and uh they're uh you know they they got a central they call it their onion core thing so yeah for sure they it's you know, a that, shrek reactor <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 but but they, i believe that they're stockpiling thorium somehow i don't know how but they, they said they were buying thorium uh copenhagen yeah oh well yeah they have to i mean you know they've you know, if they want to, you know, we're, you know, Thorium Energy Alliance would love to be able to supply them with with Thorium or at least, you know, we want people to use this stuff, right? That's why we exist. So we, we kind of, you know, I try not to, you know, as best as I could put it, I try not to have a dog in the fight per se. You know, I want I want people who need Thorium to get Thorium. And I would like to supply it to them, but if I, if until we get our license, from the NRC, you know, I will point them to where I think they can find it. Uh, like I said earlier in our discussion, it's, uh, it's, you know, it, it, for, for there being billions of liberated kilograms of this stuff laying around, it's a, it's proves to be phenomenally difficult to find an industrial supplier for, for the mm. material, especially since the war, you know, a lot of things go back to that. We used to get a pretty good amount from Russia for, uh for folks uh, who needed it you know we for instance dow chemical and wr grace used to make catalysts for cracking natural gas into uh ethylene for plastics mm-hmm. and they would make thoriated catalysts and these are you know big sort of heat exchanger looking things uh you know it's like uh it's it's like the catalytic converter in your car but bigger and Hugely successful. They lasted five, six times longer than they ever thought they would. They thought they'd be pretty fragile. It turns out they were very, very robust. You know, hugely energy efficient. You know, they 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 were, you know, better by many X, the next best thing. The OPI, Oil Petroleum Institute, actually got a hold of us several years ago. And they were aiming to bring back the thorium catalyst because they're like, just Going back to those catalytic converters, so to speak, for doing cracking petroleum into gasoline and diesel and, you know, all the other components that you get out. It's like just doing that, we think, might save around 20 cents a gallon, you know, uh, and and that doesn't sound like a lot. But if you moved, if you per- permanently Please. removed 20 yeah. cents, people would lose their, you know, that would be world changing. Yeah, that's a billion and, <laughs> yeah so so that you know they so they're so they're highly motivated to to finally work through their fear and put up with the 
policy headaches and the, the, the other headaches that come along with using activated material or source term or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. you know, but like we said, the nice thing about thorium is it's norm, right? It's a naturally occurring radioactive material. We don't have to do anything to it. We don't have to enrich it. We don't need to chemically change it. We Just don't need to. It. Yeah, we, we basically. I mean, this, this ties into two questions that I wanted to ask you, because obviously I, 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 I still still look at, you know, everything that comes out of the Thorium Energy Alliance with great interest. There were two things that I noticed. One is the Thorium Bank, which which we which we talked about earlier. Is that still a thing that you're working on? I'm sorry. Could you say that again? The, the Thorium Bank, is right? That, is that still a thing that you're working on? Oh yeah, that's what. That's essentially a really simple way of describing like a Thorium Strategic Reserve or a mm. Thorium Stockpile. We just wanted to. We call it a Thorium Bank. Uh, there is actually, it's it turns out there, there is a uranium bank out there and it's the same thing. It's so that people who need thorium could get it. So that's what we're actually trying to license. We're trying to license uh, uh, in conjunction with a company that wants to process rare earths. We, uh, we want to take the thorium that comes out of that process and essentially store it Uh if we can, we want to take the thorium that comes out of the rare earth digestion process, do a little tiny bit of work to it so it's more appropriate to what folks like Copenhagen Atomics or Clean Core Thorium Energy need. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would be a very simple, straightforward chemical circuit to do that. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, we are have pretty good confidence, knock on wood, uh, <laughs> that... Uh, uh, that because of the nature of the regulations in the United States, we aren't mining thorium. We aren't we aren't doing work to rare earths to get thorium. Thorium is just like magically occurring. So it's called a side stream byproduct. And because it's not the purpose of the mine and not the purpose of the process, but it just occurs. The law says pretty straightforward that we should get a license in order to handle it and and yeah, you simply take it stuff. off their hands. It's a problem. Yeah, for we're we're, act, we're mostly acting like you know, to put it bluntly, we're kind of being garbage men, you know. But <laughs> yeah, it was. You know, but uh, but uh, so but but we're we're taking the garbage and making it into useful. I guess we were like the recycling men or so, right, something. Right, right. Pick your pick your analogy, but. Uh, you know, we're you're the garbage men who are putting valuable stuff inside a bank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but the bank, the 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 bank, the model of the bank, the philosophy of the bank. That is what we're basically still work every day. That is our number one thing right now. Probably policy wise, our number one thing is to get thorium classified as its own material, uh, and then you know everything else is is. Uh, we're pretty evenly, you know, spending our time trying to promote thorium as a critical material, you know. Yeah. And, hey, and there was there was a second thing. I saw something about a, a molten salt reactor that you were developing, or someone someone was developing that that, that put thorium energy alliance on it. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know about that. I'll sell them some stickers. They can throw <laughs> thorium energy alliance stickers on it. Uh, real. Uh, the Chinese, as we spoke about earlier, has the TMSR thorium molten salt reactor LF1 liquid fuel one that should be running right now. That, that is and a couple megawatts, right? It's really small. Really small. It's just an effects test. They're trying to, you know, get to understand how it behaves. And and that's very similar philosophy to what Abilene Christian University is doing with their uh their recently approved reactor. Yeah, to these, do a, these things are critical, right? Yeah, they would be critical. They would, you know, they would be real full running. Although, uh, you know, I think one of the smartest things TerraPower did was they ran some effects test reactors with just natural uranium. Mm. Uh, so they knew they got an under uh, natural uranium and enriched uranium act chemically the same. Yeah. So they got to understand any issues that would come from like corrosion or reprocessing or what's called redox control mm. yeah, and they did it in a non-nuclear way you know even though it was uranium 
It was, you know, it was non-enriched uranium. So they they did some good experiments with that. Perfectly, uh, perfectly, you know, good and safe and well managed stuff. And the Chinese did that. You know, I encourage other reactor developers to take that approach. Uh, just so they can at least start learning about some of the properties and how to handle things. And then when they get the permission slips from the government to work with, uh, you know, more enriched materials and, and things like that, then they can go ahead. They'll already have a head start on it. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice, safe, high impact, low cost way to get into the, into the nuclear space. I think, I, I believe, I think that was a good philosophy and a good approach, yeah. but yeah, the Chinese, the Chinese uh, are developing things like they develop anything. They, you know, when we make a reactor, we make a reactor. Then we have to have an autopsy and spend years crying and wringing our hands out. And then we get to maybe do another reactor where the Chinese are like, we're going to start building all three reactors. So we're going to build a two megawatt one and then a 20 megawatt one and then a 200 megawatt one. But we're going to just start all at once. But when the two megawatt ones finish, the 20 megawatt one anything we learn we can still go back and change the 20 megawatt one right. and anything we learn from that we can still have time to change the 200 megawatt one so that's highly compressed development cycle it's so frustrating to see that 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 the west simply cannot adopt a more efficient way of doing this stuff yeah it is frustrating it, it, this, <laughs> this is this is the final note and after after that i think we've learned enough i mean yeah. I once shared a, a picture with you of, of the little pressurized water reactor that we have in the Netherlands. And I, they 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 ordered it. They they basically went to Germany and they said, that, I believe it was Convoy at that time. And they basically said, listen, we want a turnkey nuclear power plant. And we order it today in 1967. And, <laughs> and, and, and it, no, it was, nine, yeah, 1969. 1969 and it and it and it went online in in 1973 i mean four yeah. years later yeah I mean, in the 60s we can do that stuff like that you know no problem and, well and it was the the the, the american and uh version of that is idaho national lab which was argon west from 1950 to 1980 built 70 reactors essentially two reactors a year and then from 1980 to today, none. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like, how come we were, and they were safe and they were out in the desert. Yeah. And, you know, everybody wanted to go home at night and see their, see their children. These weren't cowboys. These, they weren't nuts, you know? So this idea that like only things going slowly can be safe. It's like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Still you know, the, the amount of learning, we're still feasting off of that knowledge. You know, and we've had it's it's like the idea factory. It's a great book. It's probably right behind me here. But the idea factory, you know, the great quote in it is our forefathers built a and laid out a buffet of technology for us to feast off of. And we've not put any new dishes on the table in a long time. You know, we need Boring to start cooks. putting. <laughs> we I mean, need to start putting cooks. more dishes on the technology buffet exactly and uh or or even just remake the dishes like i'm just i'm we're not even trying to invent new things to do with thorium we're literally just going through the record and being like oh my god they used to make mag thor we should bring that back oh my god they used to make thoria you know crucibles uh, let's bring that we're just trying to bring back stuff we haven't even yeah. gotten to new I mean, stuff yet <laughs> i mean that's 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 60 stuff imagine what would happen if we would deploy some real r&d power and try to come oh. up with new stuff i mean i mean batteries i mean yeah. i know i was you know crapping on batteries earlier but like if you want batteries make them out of you know i mean there's a not there's a non-zero chance thoriated batteries could be extra powerful and extra dense <laughs> but of course then you'd have crying and sheets of tears from pants wetting people who are like oh but it's your it's you know, it's no more radioactive than their smoke detector in your house. You put ionizing radiation in your house and your microwave 
how many people are going to get rid of smoke detectors? You know, how many oh, people yeah. are going to get rid of microwaves? Uh, what about the people who just go out and sunbathe all the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or take a transatlantic flight. Right. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so go drive in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't visit Colorado. You're going to be on top of a giant pile of radioactive granite a mile up in the air. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You're getting more, more, more radiation from the sky and below at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Don't. Switzerland is off limits. Everyone's got to evacuate Switzerland because of the background radiation. It's horrible. <laughs> John, I think that we could go on for hours like this. Yeah, yeah, for sure, brother. <laughs> I, I think that we will go and uh, basically uh, say goodbye to our friends who are watching. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, with that, I want to say to everybody, uh, thank you all for watching and may the strong force be with you. Bye-bye. I'm very grateful, grateful for the opportunity to speak to you and your, your followers. Absolutely. Thank you.